Lauren Morgan, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Very welcome. Glad to have you on. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know you, Lauren, um, give us a quick overview, maybe a 30-second overview of where you're at, who you're working for, and what you're doing at the minute. Sure. So uh, again, my name's Lauren Morgan. I work for Brookfield Properties De- uh, Development in the Mixed Use Development Group. So uh, Brookfield's mostly well known for the office side of things, but um, that uh, focus here is on mixed use and uh, physically located in San Francisco. Uh, although I work on projects, uh, you know, covering the whole nation, uh, and you know, predominantly with a, a mixed use slash residential multifamily focus, uh, a lot of high density stuff there, but some office to office buildings and retail uh, as well. Brilliant. Good. So let's, uh, we, we will get through your career. I'm interested to, to, to hear about your, uh, your kind of transition over to, to San Fran from Virginia, but let's all go all the way back to your U S Naval Academy days. Give me an idea. And even before that, what was the, what was the plan growing up? I always like to ask this question when you're growing up, did you always see yourself in, in real estate construction development or was there a, was there another, other ambitions? Yeah. So, so growing up, so I grew up in, uh, in Maryland, just, uh, North of Washington, DC, uh, grew up, uh, mostly, uh, just trying to not anger my parents, uh, you know, <laughs> do, uh, do well in school. And then, uh, a lot of, uh, athletics. So we, we talked a little bit b- before this about, uh, about soccer. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of athletics, frankly, I, you know, I, the, my, my grandfather had served during World War II. And so like, if you go back in history, the family had some, some military ties, but not, uh, not with my father or, or the close in family, if you will. So, uh, yeah, I think I thought, uh, you know, I, I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Maybe I'll go, I don't know, to wall street. Yeah. I, who knows. Right. Yeah. Then, uh, then I got this notion of, uh, service Academy. And so then I, I started focusing on the opportunities that, presented and so and they're pretty outside the norm compared to just going to you know a regular great academic institution uh and that 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 moved me enough that once i made that decision i frankly uh i should have mentioned this my my father growing up was in construction brilliant um and so i had had some exposure to it you know watch watch people you know walk steel back in the day and uh, saw some things being built. And, and so I thought, you know, I think like most kids, like that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I want a piece and, of that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, but it was never really first and foremost. I, I, I pretty much went into the academy thinking I was going to take a shot at a career in the military. Good. Um, you know, then you, then you've got to live it and then you, you, you get a family and you get responsibilities and then you start looking at, uh, at other options. So, when, uh, yeah. So then when I got out, I said, well, okay, now what do I do? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that, that, that's where the transition to the, the re, um, uh, introduction to construction kind of happened. Brilliant. Brilliant. And give us a, without stating the obvious, how does it differ the academy to your, your traditional construction management degree or civil engineering degree? So, uh, in some ways, um, you actually cover more engineering is, is what I'm able to gather. Uh, very few regular institutions require, you know, naval architecture class, uh, weapon systems engineering, um, you know, so some of the complexity of the systems that are in the modern Navy, frankly, are more robust than what's, you know, in a typical building. Yeah. So the Naval Academy does their best to prepare future officers for, <clears throat> for that sort of environment. So uh, pretty technical, even, you know, I've got an economics degree, but I, I have a bachelor's of science in economics degree. Even our, uh, even our English majors get a, uh, get a, get a bachelor's of science because of how much uh, math and engineering is kind of uh, foisted upon them, if you will. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's a big difference. I think the military side of things does have a big impact uh, in terms of the time commitments for, you know, compared to a regular college kid. Uh even even my uh, my non athlete buddies at school had uh, didn't have anywhere near the amount of time to get in trouble as my friends that were going to University of Maryland or Clemson or or, or wherever. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's always a plus. Let's be honest, because we're we're pro- <laughs> we're probably at our most mischievous at that age. Uh, as a as a 
as a father now, I appreciate that even more, right? <laughs> when I was in it, maybe a little less. Yeah, exactly. So give us a, a couple of, uh, just a, I know with, I like your LinkedIn. It's quite detailed in the tasks, the, the campaigns and the, 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 the Naval Special Warfare Group 1 in particular. Give us a, an, a, an idea of one. I mean, it's, there seems to be a lot of operations, maintenance, scheduling, planning. Um, there seems to be a, a high, high, and even responsibility. I see one there, you were a student, but it, it seems like you, you had like a budget of 70 million uh, to train, equip uh, uh, certain Navy SEAL teams. I mean, there, there was a lot of responsibility given early on. Is that something that's normal or was it just because maybe you were high performing? So, uh, well, one, I'd say it's actually fairly normal. So even going back earlier into my, so when I graduated from the academy, I became a surface warfare officer. Uh, I was first assigned to uh, USS Donald Cook, which is a, a destroyer based out of Norfolk. You know, this this asset, this you know U.S. asset, is a billion dollar warship, right? And so you're fresh out of college, and one of the first things you're you're forced to do is to learn how to kind of safely, essentially drive the ship for 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 ease of uh, description, mm -hmm. and uh, and then very quickly you're tasked with being in charge of the safety of the entire ship. Uh, you know, because, you know, it could be three o'clock in the morning and, uh, you know, certainly at the time you feel like, well, wait, all the adults are asleep and I'm in charge. It's quite a, uh, it's quite a lot when you think about a, you know, 500 foot long warship that if something goes wrong has international ramifications, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, you just graduated school a year ago or <laughs> a year and a half ago. So, um, I think uh, particularly for uh, uh, in the officer corps, that sort of expectation is kind of there day one. Um, and so, yeah, lots of logistical uh, planning, executing, you know, you get to you, you get to do a lot of very detailed kind of mission oriented planning, if you will, because uh, nothing is simple, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're in the middle of the Red Sea, how do you get oil? How do you get food how do you get uh munitions if that's the task it's um so thinking through all those steps uh like a logistician is kind of everybody's job frankly because um it's required fast forward to uh my time with uh so so i uh, then decided i wanted a career change and decided to put in to get to go become a navy seal um and so as an officer, again, you're, you're kind of in, you're kind of in charge, even though you're in training. Uh, unfortunately I got, uh, you know, I got medically dropped from training, so I didn't get to, to live that, uh, that dream, if you will. Uh, but it was still a great experience. You know, the, 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 the amount of, frankly, just to step up and say, you want to do it. I mean, you see some really, you know, great, great kids, great, uh, great future, um, you know, warriors that are going to go and, uh, and do some cool things. Uh, physically rigorous and, you know, uh, you know, a little bad luck, uh, just like on the, uh, on the football pitch. <laughs> we all need, <laughs> we, we all need to stay clear of injury for any sort of career. You're right. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, didn't work out, but then I got actually, uh, oddly enough, I then went over to special warfare group one, which is kind of the administrative side of all the West coast seals. And, uh, you know, got to at least add some value in terms of, uh, you know, planning and budgeting and how to, you know, cause, at the time, you got to go back a few years, but the, the, you know, everything through the Navy, of course, is, you know, taxpayer dollars. And with the war on terror and 9-11 and all that stuff, a lot of that was being funded in a temporary manner, and they had to convert to permanent funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had to justify all those you know, funding requests, not, not unlike my, uh, my job now, where I'm like, well, I got to, we have to justify the cost of the deal to get the return we want, right? So, yeah. Uh, you, I think it's one of those, you certainly would have never thought of drawing the parallels, but in hindsight, you can in terms of, you know, uh, moving forward. Yeah. And even in construction, I mean, I, I would imagine you're, you're drawing parallels every day. I mean, I was going to ask you what were the big lessons learned that you think, you know what, what I learned in those, not, not only at the academy, but the experience of, of being out there in the, in, in the thick of it. What do you think were the big take takeaways? Uh, yeah, no, I think, you know, uh, Prior, you know, prior planning goes a long way, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, thinking through all your options, uh, and then frankly, having backup plans, right? Um, I think that those sorts of, uh, well, and then just, you know, communicating and executing and all, all that other good stuff, right? I mean, it's, 
it's all very there, there are parallels whether it's between you you know your personal professional life the your company life your family life you know all these things i think are are kind of uh time honored and tested skills that some people just you know learn along the way some people had to be taught but um pretty important i think in terms of uh growth and uh you know execution um and advancement if you will Brilliant. Or just yeah. getting things done yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what we're all about in the construction market getting it done uh so then obviously finished up there um straight into the clark construction i mean a fantastic company um to be able to do your learn, learn the trade project engineer four and a half years um, worked on some, by the sound, looks of things, some big projects. How was that? Did that give you an idea of? Because I mean, they say once you graduate, and, and we, we may come to this later on about education. Once you graduate, there's nothing like being on the field and watching things get cut, go together, especially in construction. Um, how was the project engineering role at, at Clark? Yeah, so I think um, it, it's frankly in the beginning, a lot like drinking from a fire hose, right? Um, yeah. And uh, it, there was a you know, bit of a transition there. Military, the way people communicate in the military is definitely a little different than in the civilian world, um, both for good and for bad, frankly, I would I'd probably <laughs> say. Um, and uh, so, you know, went to Clark. I mean, the advantage of being at a, at a Clark construction in particularly in the D.C. market um, is, you know, how many projects you get to look at and people talk about and you get to tour and you get to go see um, you wanted to go see a stadium, they were building that. You want to go see an office building, they're building that. You want to see a super complex uh, excavation project, they're doing that, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, residential, hotel, like you name it, in the D.C. market, um, you know, Clark Construction was either already building it, had built it, or is about to build it. Yeah. Um, and and that that is, that's tough to replicate, you um, frankly, in any market uh, with any organization. So feel real fortunate for that. And there's a, a, a wealth of experience to, to your point where they've, they've got some folks in there, you know, uh, any given room and they've got, you know, hundreds of years of construction experience to, to, to talk about and weigh through options and, uh, and, and possibilities. Brilliant. And to me, that is the biggest thing. I mean, whether it's an actual organized mentorship program or it's just someone to be able to tap on the shoulder and go, hey, Joe, what? why did you do that, that excavation like that? What, what were you thinking? Um, yeah. And I mean... Yeah, I was going to say, absolutely. Because, um, you know, while... Uh, and, I, you, you know, I didn't really plan to go into pre-construction, but um, whether it's in the field or in the office... Uh, ha having to be able to, you know, go talk to your, your direct boss or manager and then to, to have someone that they can point to and say, Oh, call this person. Yeah. Um, it's hugely invaluable. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, and the diversity as well. Um, it's a big thing to be able to see multiple, multiple types of projects, multiple markets. Um, so then again, going from there, um, what drove you or what kind of, what made you go pre-construction? Um, was it a conscious decision? Was it something you saw in the field? Was it a mentor advised you to go that way? So, um, frankly, one of the reasons I'm on the podcast is because I don't think any mentors recommend folks go, go into pre-con, which I think is a, a bit of a, a miss, frankly, yeah. for the industry. Uh, for me, actually, it was uh, I needed knee surgery. So I, 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 I had separated, you know, departed from the Navy, um, and had already actually torn my, uh, my ACL, um, for the second time. Well, that's a different story. Wow. Um, and, but I was like, Hey, look, I don't want to be, be, uh, you know, come to my new job already banged up. So I'll take a while, take some time, you know, uh, got healed enough so that I was able to go out in the field and work kind of, um, you know, push and finish subs. This is during the condo boom. Right. So, yeah. uh, was pushing sub the finished trades, uh, then went and did a kind of a, a punch list job, which is, I, I feel like that's the, um, the bane of every young construction person's existence, but it's kind of a necessary rite of passage if I, you know, uh, at least a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's gotta um, be done for me as well. Yeah. You, if you, if you haven't done a good, a good comprehensive punch list, then you don't qualify. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you've got a, you, you, you've, everyone's, a, it's kind of like a, a, what I imagine the, I don't know, fraternities doing real school. It's like, you gotta, everyone needs that common pain and suffering uh, to <laughs> elevate uh, later on. Yeah. It should be um, on your resume right beside uh, your, your degree. 
That's right. That's right. It should be that. That should be the next bullet item. Um, <laughs> and uh, but then I, you know, I had to plan the knee surgery. What you know, didn't want to um, uh, had to do that. And so they the they were like, hey, so there's always a need in our pre construction group. Um, you know, why don't, we're going to send you there. Uh, of course, I didn't really even know what that was. I really got into thinking I was going to go be a project manager, frankly, yeah, yeah, uh, which yeah. I think a lot of folks do and uh, got there and was immediately fascinated by the problems and challenges that face the, the pre-con world. And um, I think it's a, a great place to start because of how quickly you can, you know, you can work, you know, uh, let's just say at any one time you're working one to, I don't know, five deals, right? Yeah. But out in the field, you can only work one. Yeah. And in that one, you're probably focused on a specific subset of that project, you know? Yeah. Um, while in pre-con you get to, you get to build the whole thing in your mind over and over and over again, and then you have to communicate that out. Uh, so I think the learning curve is very steep in pre-con. So, uh, and, and I was fortunate enough that the gentleman that was running pre-con at the time, who, who frankly is still running pre-con for, uh, Clark in DC, just a fantastic human being, uh, you know, really taught me uh, a lot and was, uh, was patient with my, uh, my early, my, my uh, early mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a certain, it's, it's like soccer. If you come back to the analogy, like people always ask me, why do you not go into to, to soccer coaching or, or management? You got to have a certain patience with people. Um, trying to teach something, something that you can do in your sleep is difficult and needs a set. And my mom was a teacher. So um, she, everybody thought I would do it, but I just, I just don't have the patience, don't have the skill set to be able to do it. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. In fact, when it comes to sports, I always said like, I was not going to train. It, it either had to be super little kids where it was just fun yeah. or they need to be like super hyper competitive and already <laughs> like got the basics down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's one of the other hundred percent. You're either in it or you're, you're, you're just not um, cool. So, I mean, that, that to me, that, 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 that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, going into pre-con, even with your, your naval experience, the, pl the planning, the, the scheduling, um, it, it, it makes perfect sense. What I like about it. And, and as we said this before we started recording, Lauren is, we always talk about the three-legged stool. You've got the owner, you've got the architect, and you've got the GC. We've we've had architects on, we've had GCs, but very few from the owner side. Give us an idea. I mean, you went you went and worked with some great companies, Graystar, Avalon Bay Communities, and now with Brookfield Properties. Give me an idea of the challenges working from an owner within pre-construction. Um, what are your daily challenges? What are what are your headaches with the with architects with GCs? What how 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 can we make this? this magic triangle a little bit easier on everyone? Yeah. So, uh, well, so I, I, I think the, to make it easier, I, a lot of it, I think, again, it comes back to those kind of soft skills of communication, table setting. <clears throat> um, I think the, the industry is still kind of untrustful of one another uh, in, as a, as a general rule. And I think in, in, frankly, in many cases, certainly historically, that's probably was appropriate. Uh, but, uh, we're, we're, you know, departing from that kind of, uh, lump sum hard bid mentality, rip it and grin, you know, yeah, while that's exciting, if you're an estimator in the bid room, um, you know, the, the industry is kind of pushing past that and going to a more collaborative approach. Um, and so I, I think that is really incumbent upon, yeah, you know, frankly, the owner, right. Whether that be the the development manager, or if, if like, I'm fortunate enough that our organization has devoted the resources to having a kind of a construction manager, although we have some different uh, terminology we use, uh, where there's a construction person, frankly, to be there at the table from day one, set the standards, clear up the, any ambiguities, um, you know, uh, so I think that that's a lot of it, but it, there, there's always going to be what I think of as a healthy tension. It should yeah. be healthy and respectful that that should be the table stakes, if you will. But, um, you know, between the, the architects who are being asked to, uh, do both a function, you know, functional work of art, as well as express it, uh, with the revenue projections that the development guy is, is frankly, needs in order to make the deal go get the returns that are needed whether that be through um, a private investment group or you know uh, you know uh, Avalon Bays or REIT so they they've got other uh, thresholds but there's always a threshold um, 
And so um, he, he's got that challenge. Uh, for, for me in my seat, the, the biggest advantage I think of, uh, uh, or the biggest challenge is just trying to marry all that up with the real world <clears throat> realities of what stuff costs, right? Yeah. Um, drawing something on paper is both, uh, is pretty economical. Um, but the, the downstream ramifications uh, and decisions you're making uh, at that time can really have lasting impacts. And so getting down to that bare truth, um, I think, is, is a lot of what, you know, I, me and my group does. But I think it should be in the mind of every kind of pre-con person, right, is yeah. uh, what does this really represent, both in terms of how you're going to build it, uh, and then what's the quality level associated with it. And yeah. so you can, you can give enough guidance to your, your design team and your, whoever's in charge, you know, the developer, uh, to be able to make a decision, right. Yeah. You know, uh, that's really a big part of the pre-con rule process is giving them the data so that they can make a business decision. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and I mean that, that that makes perfect sense. And then, whenever it comes to Brookfield, um, what do you guys do? What kind of criteria do do contractors need to head for you to use them on the GC side? Have you got a select few that you use? Do you do you go out to market a quite a lot of? Because if you're working all over the, the US, do you go local? Do you do, do guys travel with you? What sort of, especially as you as VP of Precon, what's what do you look for, and how do you go about that process? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, I mean, first and foremost, I think we look um, very rarely are we going to try to be the, especially if it's a tried and true product, we're, we're looking for established resumes and credentials, you know, because uh, normally we're trying to operate, you know, at the higher end of the market uh, in most markets. And so we're looking for uh, the type of contractor that frankly, can service all of our needs, really. And so that requires a certain level of sophistication, certain level of just bandwidth and resources in terms of being able to, uh, you know, facilitate those projects, uh, because we're, we're demanding, right? Like, um, so we, we normally do a, a pretty early selection process and try to bring on those contractors uh, still well into the design phase. Um, and so, I mean, we, when we have a fiduciary relationship, you know, kind of upstream of us as well. So we, we've got to show some level of competition, uh, but we are looking for a best value approach. So uh, best value, you know, it, 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 and many times comes down to the individual team itself, right? Yeah. So uh, it's not just, um, you know, uh, pick whatever great, you know, national contractor. It's not just that name. We're worried about who's the project manager, who is the individual superintendent? Uh, what are they bringing to the table to service us as the client? Brilliant. And then obviously you're looking at the pre-construction, the estimating team as well to be able to, because uh, that I would imagine those are the people, especially early on with the design team. And you may have a, a senior PM or a project executive that'll be involved in that, but is it mostly the pre-con team within the contractor and the architect that gets involved early? Yeah, so uh, some of that I think is kind of... Uh, up to the contractor, right? So mm -hmm. there are certain uh, GCs nationwide where they they take a holistic approach that they don't they don't really have the bifurcation of uh, of the front end teams that other GCs do. So some GCs have an estimating team and a precon team and a purchasing team and then a operations team. Uh, other other GCs take the approach of no 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 we're we're we're, we're training you know. Uh, our leaders to be able to handle the full life cycle. So a little bit, some of that is, is kind of up to the contractor because it, ultimately it's not really as the owner, it's not my job to tell the general contractor his means and methods and how he's going to operate. Right. Like yeah. that, that's why we're paying him. Yeah. Um, as much as you probably would like to at some stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, th th there's always a fine line, right? Yeah, uh, of course. That, and frankly, that's one of the, the, the challenges for, for a construction guy to go from the GC side to the ownership side is, is um, you know, having that role kind of appropriate in their mind of, well, just cause I did it this way and it was successful you can't force them to do it that way. That's not how the contracts work. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, so it's, um, you know, it, it, again, the selection process, I think the, the, the big thing for us is to get all of the, the items on the table as early as possible so that um, we're negotiating it holistically 
and then we we've got a deal and then the, you know there's certain things that have to be left to to later on but uh plenty of things you can you can get done now so that you know when you get to the finish line you're going to be able to go execute Brilliant. you know yeah. and that's uh that's that's very important to us as well Brilliant. Um, and to give, we, we get a lot of like uh, graduates and junior people within the industry listening to the podcast. Um, if, and, and one thing, in fairness to a few of them, they actually asked me this question, say, ask your, ask your guests this question on a day-to-day -day basis. And I know it's kind of a difficult question to answer, but what is like a VP of pre-con within someone like Brookfield? What, what do you do? And, and we, the, the best way to probably answer it might be to just take a project and give an idea of, what do you do as soon as you hear about a project? You guys are thinking about a project. How does that, how does that process work? Yeah, sure. No, it's a, it, it's, it's a great question. Cause those, uh, frankly, a lot of my day to day, as opposed to my directors is, uh, is frankly, is the goal is to be a little more forward thinking than just in the moment. So, uh, there's a little bit of that, but for, for project specific stuff, a lot of it will be, you find out about a project, you know, like most GCs, you've got no drawings or you've got a, a napkin sketch, if you will. Uh, and, and a lot of what you'll do is actually try to further define the vision uh, with your development partner. And then it, if there's a designer on board already, bring them into it as well. So uh, that, that comes down to program. Like, what are you really building? Um, what, where are you building it? And then what's the quality level? I mean, yeah. those are generically those are the things i mean there's a lot of details that go into that stuff um that um that that are pro you know uh project type dependent i mean the challenges of of uh office development versus uh multifamily you know well, the details are very different but i think the buckets are all kind of the same so it's uh, identifying those uh trying to put you know uh put it in a box if you will and then figure out if you're trying to, you know, a lot of times you were, you're, you're trying to figure out what that costs. Right. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, I think most pre-con guys start with their historical databases. Um, and then if that's found wanting, then you start reaching out to the, the industry. Yeah. Uh, as the owner, that's a little easier. Um, I'm, I go, I can call, you know, a couple different GCs and get, you know, some high level input, you know, all in fairly quickly. Good. Uh, back when I, back when I was the GC, a lot of times you're calling your, your, your kind of key subs, your, uh, your structure, your facade, your MEP guys to, to get those inputs so that you're kind of, uh, narrowing down what you're guessing on and, uh, using other people's more educated guesses. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and you've touched on something there that, that I'm interested in. You mentioned reaching out to GCs and them going and looking at their historical data. Um, how important is that for someone like you to, for them to be able to present something and go, listen, this is this, we built the same project in a different location two and a half years ago, and this is what the costs were. And this is how the, the cost variant is going to affect your, your, your proposed project. Um, how important is that? Because the way I see it is, Pre-construction data is going to be a big, big game changer in 2021. Um, it's one of the predictions I've made. If they, if people haven't started scraping their data or getting organizing their data, then they're going to be left behind. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, certainly the type of contractor DCs that we want to we want to be working with are ones that I could call. We could have a you know uh, a decent conversation about whatever it is we're looking to to, to price. Um, but ideally they've built it before and they can tell me, okay, after that conversation, they could then take their historical database, whether they need to adjust it for, you know, escalation time, uh, or, you know, perhaps we could talk through quality factors, but, uh, it, a lot of it comes down to, frankly, the communication side of it is when you represent, you got to be able to represent a number quickly, but you also have to be able to represent what that number, uh, is describing. Yeah. in terms of quality and program and uh, ratios, you know, it's the, but the, the goal is to be, I think most folks want to be very data driven in these early days. Uh, but also a lot of times that early number, I mean, that early number can kill a deal, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, it's a challenge of the industry where you have to be able to forecast costs when there's no data and then be able to live with it once it's a fully designed project. Right. Yeah. So uh, if, if you don't have that, or at least to be able to explain the variances when, when you get there, I think that's yeah. a, 
uh, and, and that's a huge skill set. And, and again, it, it starts with the data, right? Um, uh, you know, it, it, having access to it, being able to describe it, being able to talk about it and kind of turn those numbers uh, give life to them, if you will. Yeah, because I mean, it's 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 a constant uh, fight that I have with with myself and the candidates because pre-construction and estimators generally they're a little bit more introverted. They wouldn't be as social. They would, wouldn't be as good as communicating. No, not for everyone, obviously, but being able to display the data and 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 almost give it in layman's term, like for someone like me to to understand it, can be quite difficult. Is there any yeah. cool technology or cool cool kind of tools that, that, that you've seen construction companies use or even you guys use yourself for, for illustrating data analytics, anything like that? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, we're, one of the things, I, you know, I am trying to do is to constantly evaluate the current technology. Uh, one of the challenges I have is most of the, the big uh, technology solutions, whether it be for databasing or estimating, are really more targeted at that GC audience because it's such a bigger, you know, potential, uh, you know, client base. Yeah. Uh, but in many ways, it, it doesn't fit my specific need, yeah. which is much more of the, you know, databasing, but, but higher level. Um, yeah. You know, I don't necessarily need to know uh, how many brick ties are in the job, but I didn't. I do need to know. I, it would be good to know what the brick costs. You know, yeah, yeah, of uh, course, yeah, yeah. And um, so, uh, so I've not found a, a great tool. There are some some interesting tools out there that uh, in the databasing world that we're we're evaluating where you could at least get you know like a a, a by division breakdown and at least a picture of what that represents. Yeah, of course. Um, I think GCs w- sh- you should want to have that sort of high level information so that they don't have to call the, you know, marketing department to put together, uh, you know, a binder for their, for their potential clients. Uh, yeah. Having that information at the fingertips um, it, it is needed and uh, it's there, but it, it, again, I don't know that the adoption is as fast as we'd want. Yeah. Uh, and also it's just a challenge because, you know, um, uh, in terms of how do you get what is probably an Excel into that and then bring it to life again with the pictures, with the imagery, yeah. um, a- investing the time and resources to do that is it, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And listen, from Excel, you're hundred percent right. That, I mean, that's <clears throat> not only a challenge, that's probably mission impossible, bringing something from Excel and, and putting it into a lovely, fancy, sexy graph or a sexy image. He- but, I mean, it, I'm a big believer anything can be done, but it's uh, it takes time and resources. Yeah, yeah 100% a lot of time. <laughs> um, so that, 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 that to me is a big challenge. And I think it's out there. That there's people working on it. There's pre-construction technology companies that are working on this stuff. I believe that that, that piece of software that the GC can can, can – use as, a, as an estimating database and then there's a there's a, a, a workflow that the client can use and get certain amounts of the, the cost and can manipulate it and check it and hopefully not live but a, a, as live as can be and then the architect can 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 have a login to, to see the back end of it or make sure his design is not completely getting ripped to shreds yeah you know i mean it's and it's a it's a challenge I mean, right now real world we're having a challenge where you know, we're doing, we're, we're evaluating future projects. We're, we're trying to put some cost to it, but you know, we don't have a design. We don't, we, 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 we don't really, we kind of only loosely know the program. Um, but of course, like it, it would really bring it to life. If again, if we had like just the hard data and then a picture showing what that data represents. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it pictures worth a, you know, a thousand words, I think is the old cliche, right? So, 100%. We're all visual, uh, whether we like right. it or not, we're all visual. Um, sure. Cool. So, and, and what, one one thing I like as well with your 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 career, it's it's very much <clears> in in the right trajectory. It's always going up the way. Um, give me an idea now of of your biggest challenge within pre construction. It can be a project. It can be a it can be a a, a problem that you came across. Um, and, and and just walk us through that what that was like because. Like people always tell me, you'll never really learn anything from a project that goes 100% perfectly because sure, sure. you, just, you um, just think it's always going to happen. But so was there any... For me, I was going to say, maybe you could learn to take a little extra time off, but that'd be about it. Um, <laughs> well, the, uh... <laughs> I, think, I think if anything, COVID taught us that. We've, we've, we've learned to spend a little bit more time with ourselves, which I think was a good thing. 
Yeah, pro, some well, pros and cons of that, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, although I think in the precon world, precon and design world, uh, I don't know that many of us got time off, frankly. Um, True. Yeah. You know, the it, very easy. You know, architects are dispersed. We can be dispersed. Um, if you got an internet and a computer, you can still. Uh, I, I always joke that, uh, you know, I've only used tools professionally, I think, on two occasions in my entire post-Navy career, right? So um, as much as I value those skills and I enjoy doing some of that stuff in my off time, uh, it's not what I get paid for. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. uh, in terms of, uh, ch- I, honestly, I think, especially from the owner's perspective, uh, I think the toughest thing is uh, you know, is, is the communication piece, frankly, because there's just so much to communicate, uh, both kind of, um, to the general contractor, to the architect or your other key designers, uh, and then your developers, but then ultimately, uh, help your developer craft the message up to the investment committee or, 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 you know, the, the actual financial mechanism to make the deal happen. Uh, we spent a lot of time in design management, frankly, um, where we're trying to set the expectations early in terms of affordability, but then also, you know, every architect I know is going to push the box a little. Yeah. And so, and they're going to try to find new ways and they're going to push. And so uh, managing that process, um, usually by that time you've got, we've got a general contractor on board and, and getting your GCs to put kind of, you know, stakes in the ground of like, look, Hey, um, here is, here is what this represents right now. Uh, but then also finding the roadmap back to where you need to be financially. I mean, it's a, it's a constant cycle. And I think if you're, but if you're, if you're pushing design, uh, and you're going for, and and some of our projects are, are, are are pretty high end projects, uh, you should be doing that. Mm. Um, I think in the, the suburban markets where you're doing a little bit more, um, uh, not affordable is not the right term, but frankly, market rate or you're, you're, you need to be a little bit more in the box. Mm-hmm. You, then it's just the discipline of staying in the box. I think that's yeah. a, because everybody wants it to be a home run. Yeah. Um, when in reality, you know, a lot of baseball games are one off of, you know, doubles and singles and triples, right? That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of it. I mean, it's the beauty of your, your job, but I, I would imagine the, the, <coughs> even the, 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 the sexy design ones and the, 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 the higher price point are just as difficult as the, as you say, the. Yeah. So I, in some ways they're more difficult, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the swings can be really dramatic. Um, and you know, you, that being said, you know, if you hire a really high end design firm, you should expect that yeah, because they, they became that, that, uh, by pushing the envelope. Right. And so, um, but we, we, we live in a world of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, ideally hard facts and figures. And if they're not working, then you got to find a way to make it work. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that can be, that's going to be an iterative process and, and trade-offs, right. It's um, you know, just like uh, everybody might, might love, uh, I don't know, the great car, but you don't want to pay for the great car. You want to, <laughs> you know, meanwhile, you still have to drive. You know? yeah, exactly. It's not an easy task. I have to say, and you're, you're out of, out of all those, the three legged stools, I think, your ability to be able to manage people's expectations and to with the architect pulling you one way and the contractor pulling you the other way it's um it's a difficult one is there any uh what's the project out there the the one that you took you know what you you, you put you, you put your hat on you go you know what I, i'm really proud of that 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 turned out really well it's looks great for the money it, it was just a project that ran smoothly yeah no it's a uh, because I, I think in some cases the answer uh, that last bit probably makes it, it makes it makes they're, they're different projects, right? I mean, uh, one of the best examples in my career was when I actually had the super in, the the lead superintendent come back to me, and I just happened to be touring the site, and he was like, he's like, hey man, how did you know we were going to need money for this item, you know? And I said, well, um, we could afford it, so I, I kept it in there, and then and then two. Um, you know, it's kind of just a lesson learned through experience, kind of the stuff we talked about before. Uh, but it, you know, very rarely do you get that sort of field direct input. Uh, yeah. And this was this was this was not an overly like sexy project. It was just kind of a uh, a market rate apartment uh, outside of Baltimore uh, back in my Graystar days. But to to have that immediate impact of hey, 
the work I did, you know, months and months ago, putting together the, the GMP, if you will, uh, putting the contract together, it, it, it saved his bacon when he was able to go and find that pool of funds to, to offset this unforeseen condition that, you know, you could argue whether or not it should have been foreseen or not, but yeah. <laughs> he doesn't care about that. He's a superintendent. He wants to get it done. Yeah, right? exactly. He's just happy the money was there. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. I mean, uh, you know, without having to go to contingency. So, yeah. um, so I, I think that that's one of the things that sticks out to me. Um, you know, some of my early pre-con days at Clark really stick out at me. Uh, unfortunately, a project that got built that I didn't get it. I, I didn't, I think I'd already moved on was a, a national law enforcement uh, uh, museum in DC Nice. Where it's basically it's an underground museum, which Ooh. is uh, pretty crazy. Um, some of the stuff uh, that I won't get into too much, but the the, the pipeline moving forward, though, I think uh, we've got a lot of opportunities for some really uh, magnificent projects. Good. I like to hear it. I like to hear it. That'll get you up in the morning. Um, cool. That's right. So Sorry. what, um, talk to me as well. I know I mentioned it previously in the podcast, but moving from Virginia to, to San Fran, we relocate a lot of estimators and pre-construction people around the U.S. Um, give us an idea of San Fran, how difficult was it moving there, finding property, you, you know, the, all this, the, the simple questions. I know you've got a family, so find a big enough house for a family. I don't know if the kids are in school. How, how, did, how did you manage that or, and how difficult was it? So, uh, thankfully Brookfield, uh, you know, uh, you know, my, my transition package was, was, was good enough that I actually had some, some options. They, you know, they worked with me, um, really strongly to help, uh, to help, you know, make the transition a smooth one. So very fortunate there. Um, di- uh, so one advantage, frankly, is that my, my kids are still on the East coast. They, they live with their mother. So that, that actually was, hugely helpful because the cost of housing out here is, is, uh, uh traditionally insane. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think the, frankly, the bigger challenge is just, you know, new coast, uh, you know, un- un- learning the uh, kind of sub markets in the neighborhoods and then just the way the city operates in terms of, okay, what does your morning really feel like when you wake up and getting to work? Right. Yeah. Uh, I'd spent most of my career in the DC area. So knew that really well. Um, and so moving around the DC area would have been easy, but coming out here, you're, you're starting from scratch. Exciting. Um, yeah, no, I mean, th- that being said, you know, California is, uh, is beautiful and, and that, that helps. Yeah. Of course. Uh, <laughs> the sun. And, and, the, 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 <laughs> and then, uh, and then frankly, I was fortunate where I, you know, I was so busy those first six months, uh, in particular that, uh, it really didn't matter. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I didn't have time to think about it. So you were just in, uh, you know, trying to trying to learn as much as you can about the organization and get up to speed so that you're, uh, you're not slowing anybody down. Brilliant. Love it. Yeah, no, it's, it's because it's, it's, a, it's a difficult transition no matter where you're moving to. But as you say, San Fran's a beautiful place. It's on the, it's on the West coast and it's, and it's got a fantastic weather. So I'm glad it went well. Um, well, listen, Lauren, thank you very much, sir. I'm, uh, I'm intrigued by, uh, by your story so far. There's no doubt about it. There's been a lot of successes, but it sounds as if there's going to be a lot more successes in the future. Uh, well, I certainly hope so. Uh, the, um, like I said, I think the, whether it's the pre-con field in general or, or Brookfield properties specifically, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And, um, you know, I, I think just trying to add value and, and learn as much as you can. And, uh, and then frankly, again, you know, take advantage of opportunities when they come up, right? I'm sure you, that's what you tell your clients is that like, hey guys, you know, evaluate that this is just an opportunity take a look at it and uh see if it's a good fit yeah i mean trying to you, we mentioned it at the very very start but trying to get people into pre-construction is it's it's just so important i see a massive a, a switch in and the the kind of the the, the, the amount of pre-construction, the amount of operations within a general contractor, there's just dis- disproportionate amount of people in operations at the moment compared to pre-con. I see that changing. I see a lot of the real good operations guys moving over to pre-con and getting involved, whether it be a project executive or a, a purely pre-con role. Um, so even at the ground level, I, I still think, and a lot of people will tell me different, I still think there should be an opportunity for a graduate not 
ha- to have to go out to the field and go straight into pre-con and you learn through 3D modeling and, and learn through their mistakes or, or learn through a reverse mentorship with a more experienced guy who's been on site because we're losing all this talent. We're losing all the talent people that just say, you know what, I don't want to do a construction because I have to wear welly boots and, and, and just run away with a hammer all day. You know what I mean? That's that's not sure, that, sure, that, sure. that's not how it is. Um it's just there's more opportunity there. There's more growth opportunities, and as you say, you just need to ask questions and, and find your path. Well, I think the the you know the the competition for talent is kind of what you're getting at, and yeah. uh, in our industry, we're going to lose out if we you know if we ignore people that could be a good fit for for this organization or for that this segment of the industry. Um, you know, you could also make a good argument that we don't place enough emphasis on soft skills. You know. Yeah. Um, that frankly become more and more valuable as you advance in your career. Um, you know, just the ability to have you know people really believe you when you tell something, when you say something. You know, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> super, and, and, super helpful. And that that is it. It's about being able to get your point across and having done the research. I mean, you know, you're right, but convincing someone is a completely different skill. That, that's right. Your 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 opinions should be able to withstand scrutiny. You know, yeah, and that's uh, yeah. whether, whether that be uh, a data driven approach or because, yeah. um, uh, frankly, there, there's plenty of this industry that is subjective. And so yeah. uh, you, you got to be able to do both. And frankly, that's part of that's part of the challenge. Right. Yeah. And, and, and in pre-construction, we're getting challenged every day from all ends. Every day. We, and you almost can't win it by 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 uh, by some accounts. A, a, a friend of mine uh, once described it as uh, you've got to be able to shoot yourself out of every meeting. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're just just sitting there, and everybody's uh, you know, and diving at you. Yeah. Whether it's the owner, the architect, the structural engineer, the GC, whoever, everybody's shooting at you. You got to be able to shoot back. One hundred percent. And we need to start. We need to start cutting some ribbons as well, and taking some more uh, accolades and, and some more praise. We don't get enough praise in pre-construction and estimating. Well, that's I kind of just like in the military, there are operational successes and intelligence failures. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you ever heard that saying. No, uh, I, I kind of like feel it. like that. I kind of feel like that's the way the construction industry thinks of precon, right? Like it was an operational success. The the project managers built the deal and it worked. Uh, but if it, if the numbers didn't work, then it was the front end guy's fault, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna use that as a, as a tagline on your podcast. So there you are. Okay, I, I've got sure. it sorted. I love it. <laughs> great, great. Well, with that, I do have to jump. Uh, been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much, Lauren. Yeah. Look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, sir.